Hey, what's up, everyone? This is David Greenspan, and you are listening to Season 2 of the Mindshare Podcast, a proud member of the Industry Syndicate Media Network. Additional podcasts are available at Mindshare101.com and on all the major podcast platforms. This week's episode is sponsored by Kits Keep in Touch Systems. This is Episode 83. He sells luxury real estate in Toronto. He is an active supporter of over 30 charities here in the city. He's been featured on HGTV's Open House Overhaul, and he uses social media as an integral part of his real estate business. He is the founder of the real estate and lifestyle brand, James in the City. Here with me on the Mindshare Podcast today is my friend, James Malonis, a.k.a. James Lewis, a.k.a. James in the City. Welcome to the show, my man. How's it going, David? Thanks for having me. Buddy, it's going, man. I'm excited to have you here today, man. Thank you for, uh, thank you for making the time. Seriously, I know uh, this has been long overdue for sure. Yeah, you know what? Episode 83 is exactly how I feel on the inside. I feel 83, so this is <laughs> Well, that's not a good thing, man. We want you feeling younger rather than older. No, man. I feel like an 83-year-old Jewish woman in Florida. Like, I'm golden right now. <laughs> Just need to get a little bit of a haircut, right? Don't, not, don't. Hey, not, not that I'm knocking the hair. Not that I'm knocking. Don't I'm having such a bad hair day. It's not cute. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good, buddy. You know what? I was going through that whole bad hair thing <laughs> for the past few weeks. You're well aware of it, but... Uh, I'm happy to say I got a nice cleanup. My buddy took care of me, so it's uh, it's good. But it's very different because it went from like a lot of hair to very little hair. But anyways, yeah, no, you're looking good. You, thank you, and and you can tell the sign of the times as we're all talking about hair lately these days, right? right? Um, but here, a quick snapshot. Yeah. Market hot or not, and does it matter when real estate is what you do for a living? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to answer that twice because I didn't hear the last part of the question. <laughs> yes. The market is hot. Whether you're in Toronto or York region or, or Peel or Durham or Northumberland, the market is hot. We are still in a seller's market. COVID, yes, slowed us in April, but we are back with a vengeance. June, July, August is going to be our February, March, April. Okay. So we're going to see that now. Now, so we're seeing that now. Some, and I don't want to, you know, put a bad spin on things. I'm just going to say some, because I talk to a lot of people every day. Some people got no idea, like, is this thing going to just fall off the face of the earth in like, you know, 30, 60 days? Or are we going to see this roll right through in August, September? Some people have suggested that um, unemployment rates climbing, you know, mortgage deferrals being recalled, uh, you know, just everything going on. Maybe this, this whole like next, you know, next wave. Are we seeing September start to, you know, go down or, or just what's your thoughts on that? And nobody has a crystal ball, but just curious. I was going to say, I don't have a crystal ball. I only have crystal vases. But um, the, way, <laughs> the way I see things is, okay, the unemployment rates, maybe if you live in like Nebraska or like Northwest Territories, I don't know. But things are opening back up. People are going back to work. Offices are slowly starting to hire back some people that were laid off. Offices aren't opening, but retail is. And that's what was affected the most was the retail sector. That is opening, right? We're starting to see malls, like Yorkdale opens up today. Like after oh, do this, they say I, so like full, full capacity, everybody could go shopping? Like legit, I am going to the whole rent free sale after this. <laughs> Just to go, eh? <laughs> Just to go, because I haven't bought a pair of shoes since February 10th, 2020. And that and, is a long and, time and, for me. And just not having the pair of shoes is like, you know, it needs, needs to happen. It's like, a, it's like having a burger, like you need it. So, but we are, but so, so we're, we're predicting that this thing's going to keep going or that's kind of the thought we're having right now. And that's certainly what it seems like. I mean, when we look around the landscape, a lot of people are out there back up and running. We're hearing that there's a lot of stuff happening. I agree. We were saying before we got on air, it is a seller's market. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, now's kind of the time. Like if, if you've got people that were on the fence or people that were waiting it out, if you're at that point where you're comfortable, now's the time to get these things back on the market. And here's the thing, there's, there's no inventory. That's the other thing too, eh? We're right. seeing, but we are, now we're seeing stuff that's sitting a little bit longer. Um, I don't know why, but I've seen things that sit are, are just sitting a little bit longer on the market, even below in kind of that like 900 to 1.5 range. Right. We're hearing that the market down. below that is popping hard. And then this one's still moving though. 
it, yeah, it, it's still moving. It's sitting a little bit longer. It's not selling in seven days, but closer to 30, but it comes down to pricing and positioning. Like if your house is not staged, you know, if realtors are using cell phone photos or these tiny little gross ass, you know, small resolution photos, what buyer is going to want to look at your home? Right. Right. Because right now we're spending our time looking at homes virtually. If we can't see what your home looks like, why would we want to book it in person? So for a home that's been properly staged and it's photographed well and it's marketed nicely, it's going to move. Yeah, I I, uh, I would agree with that because I know I'm always looking around and just I just like to poke around, see what's going on out there. And I mean, sometimes you'll see those photos where you're like, I can't even see what's going on, or it's blurry. Or, I mean, hell, when you when you pull up on the ones that have pools and the shot is still from you know the back air is still full of snow, the pool's not even uncovered. Yeah, guys, that's a problem. That is well, a problem. Yeah, we haven't had snow in months. Why do you still have photos with snow inside? Get your photographer back in there and re-photograph the property. So, so I come back to this then and I ask you, you know, does it matter? If this is what we do for a living, does it matter though what's going on with the market? Like, does it even, does it, is, does it matter? I don't know. No. That's what I agree with. I agree Wait, with that. Just keep going. Um, here. On this episode, I want to talk about uh, your real estate and lifestyle brand. Yes. Um, I know, James, I know that there's a ton of value that you can bring to the table on a massive uh, array of topics within this industry from marketing to, you know, ethics to, you know, the legal stuff. I mean, I know there's a lot up there. I want to I wanna take today and kind of focus on this a little bit. And, and, and I want to do this because everybody's always out there every day waking up going, I got to get another deal. And, and it's natural. I mean, in sales world and real estate world, like I want to get another deal is important. Um, but how do we do that? What do we do to go about that? And, and look, we both got a lot of friends in this business, in this industry, and, and many of them work hard at building a strong, reputable brand. And then there's some who just simply go next level with it and, and really make it a thing. And so again, for today's show, I want to I wanna really walk everybody through you know, the process of not only building, but building and living your brand. You know, the importance of not only coming up with a, uh, a logo and a set of colors for a business card, but how to actually share your brand with the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of going to take us through a process here, but, but I, I want you to kind of share that with us. Like first, how long have you been actually selling real estate? Going on seven years. Going on seven. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then, and yeah. then uh, when did you start James in the city. Um, so I, I was registered in January. James in the city was born that August. Okay. Got it. So it was pretty much immediately. Yeah. It was like just kind of figuring out what I like, who I was in the real estate process. I was young. I mean, I was 20, well, that's 22 when I started. Right. Yeah. I don't know who I was. I was in an office where everybody was over 50. I was on the third floor of my, I mean, you remember my old brokerage where I was out on young street there. Across oh yeah. The yeah. Yep. So I was on the third floor and on the north half of the building where my office was, and I hate to say it, but I was the only Caucasian guy. Ah, so now okay. I'm 22, Caucasian and gay. So I stood out like a sore thumb in that building. Got it. So I started taking my business downtown, even though I was born and raised in Richmond Hill and everybody knew my family, everybody knew who the Malonis's were. Like I couldn't even walk down to Mize Variety in South Richville to grab a chocolate bar without the neighbors recognizing me or the gross, the, uh, I actually know my variety. <laughs> I, I know exactly where that is. And my grandfather was a developer in that pocket. So we grew up there, right? Like the mayor of Richmond Hill was at our house every Friday for dinner. This was like who we were. Yeah. So I, that's why I started in Richmond Hill. I never wanted to sell there, but I figured that's who I know. And when no one wanted to work with me, because I mean, there was obviously family issues after my parents got divorced and who my father was, that's a whole other episode. But, um, People didn't want to work with me because I was young and gay, right? Like in South Richville, where homes are selling for three to seven million, they're not going to look at the kid who's like fresh out of the womb, right? Yeah. And so, so what, but, but what was the deal then? So, I mean, you know, how did that come together to build the James in the city then? I started just taking my business downtown. Okay. And I then it was kind of like, I'm now in the city. Is that kind of where it came from? Literally, it would, it would start off with me touring condos with my camera. And this is back when I still had a BlackBerry. So really shitty camera quality. And I'd just be here like, hey, guys, James, I'm in the city again. And then eventually it grew from there. So uh... James in the city again, James back in the city, eventually became James in the city. Got it. Okay, cool. Because I was wondering about that. Like, you know, when you were starting it, what did it all mean? Like, was this a... 
you know, <laughs> was this a paper napkin drawing or how did you come up with the concept? But you're saying it's because it was just that consistency of yeah. what you continue to do and, and putting yourself out there too, like getting on video back in the day when video wasn't even a thing just yet. No. And I was one of the few realtors who actually took to Instagram effectively in the beginning. Now every realtor and their mother's on Instagram. Yeah. But back then I was one of the, like, the few who actually used it to market themselves. Okay. So, so, so take us through that then, because, you know, grow up in Richmond Hill, realize that that's not really the place to be for you uh, move or start to do a lot of business down in the city. You're doing more and more and more. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I'm in the city, James in the yeah. city. So that comes together. Yeah. Now it's a matter of going, okay, so I've got the idea. Um, what was that next step? Because I could say, okay, so wait a second, if I'm checking boxes here and I'm taking some notes about this, this, you know, this process today, I go, all right, I've got an Instagram account. He said he's got Instagram. I've got Instagram. Check. Uh, I, I'm starting to find my, my voice. I'm starting to find my brand. I'm understanding how I'm, again, using this thing, James in the city. Or I know this is one guy that uses the word mindshare all the time. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, you know what I mean? It's one of those, <laughs> right? Like, and I start to figure out, oh, Mindshare 101, right? Yeah. Where do you go then from there? Like you've got the social account, you're kind of starting to feel what the flavor is. What was that next step? That just came down to defining who I was and what my brand actually was about. So I realized I wasn't a Richmond Hill agent. I was a downtown guy. Like yeah. south of Bloor, that was my, that was my hood. Um, then it came down to developing what the brand actually looked like coloring, styling, the logo. The logo hasn't changed. The logo's been the same since day one. But the, the coloring and the styling and how the ads used to look were very different than the New York today. So back then I was doing that cheesy shit where, you know, the cow sits on the fence. Like, are you stuck on the fence about moving? Like, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I did that shit and it was tacky. But the coach that I was working with at the time was into that. She's like, people love that kitschy shit. Like you're gay, people will love it. I'm like, I don't wanna be the gay realtor. Like, I don't, that's not who I am. Okay. Like, that's just a part of my life. There's so much more. So when I started factoring in that, you know, I love fashion and I have a shoe obsession and I love tequila, that all started coming into my brand. That's what I would showcase on my feed and in my stories and at events and things like that. And then because I go to so many events, I would feature that into my brand. And that's what took it from just a realtor to a lifestyle and influencer brand. Interesting, because I know, like, when you think back to moving and all that stuff, I mean, those were some of the memes that were coming out from the early days of kind of get putting yourself out there from from a social perspective. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, wait a second. And, and you know, you, you almost realize it's like you go down one road and you go, okay, you know, here's, here's what I'm developing. Mm -hmm. Then you start to analyze who am I? So I'm curious, like, you notice you don't want to be the gay realtor, but you notice that you love shoes. You love to keep, what was this actually drawn out? Cause you talk about colors and branding as well. And I know as a marketer, one thing we do is we whiteboard a lot of stuff yeah. and then we look at, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. You start to really look at it, analyze and go, is this the right message? Or, you know, does that, does that color blend with what we're trying to portray over here or that brand? Did you mark this stuff, Dan? Did you have a designer come in and do that? Like, you know, when you realize what you wanted to do or how you wanted to portray yourself versus how you didn't, did you, did, like, was there something very sophisticated about this, James? Or was this just more like fly by the seat of your pants and kind of go, this is what I want to do? No, when it came down Does to that actually sense? building. Yeah, when it came down to actually building the, the coloring and the structuring of the, the collateral side of James in the city, it was whiteboarded. It was, you know, very methodical about what it was. And the logo is in essence a mock of Sex in the City because I'm a huge Sex in the City fan. Um, I've actually worked with Kim Cattrall both when I was working in retail fashion and in real estate. Cool. Um, and I, I didn't want to have a lot of color in my brand. So I wear a lot of color, but I don't want a color to find me because I'm just like, I have to be pink, I have to be blue, I have to be this, I have to be that. Yeah. I wanted my brand to just be natural and neutral that I could take with me if I left Royal LePage and went to Remax or to Sotheby's or whatever the case is, it would flow. But also I wanted it to not be tied to real estate that I could take that brand and continue building the lifestyle you know, conglomerate that I want to have. Because there's so much in here in my, in, in my brain for those that are not watching that is going to be developing over the next couple of years that is all under James in the city. And I looked at someone like Bethany Frankel from Skinny Girl who did the same thing. She had that first notion of being a healthy chef for wealthy socialites in New York. And that you turn that into a conglomerate of lifestyle. 
So that's what I'm doing with Change City. But her initial brand has never changed. Okay, so, so you, logos, colors, you're in the exact same boat you were in back then. Yeah. So that little black and silver logo you see everywhere, yep. that has not changed in seven years. I mean, it's been tweaked here and there, yep. but it has not changed. I tried it with gold. I tried it with rose gold. Silver works the best and it's recognizable. And so now are you taking that and putting it on the business cards, the signs? Uh, I mean, all the collateral you're doing out there, is that part of your... Um, Sort of. So okay. I don't use a business card because I don't work in the 90s. Yeah. Um, on my signs, no, because I work for a brand that uses a very specific sign. So I work for Johnson & Daniel yep. and their signs are crest. It's like a, a big shielded crest. And it, that's how it's been since the day J&D was, was born. Yep. Um, I, I don't change the sign. I, I, it's not up to me. It's up to our corporate office. But that doesn't change. But on my any print marketing that I do, which is very little, like my future sheets or my listing packages, yes, the James the City logo is there because people recognize it. And even if it's not a logo, there's James in the City written somewhere over and over and over. Kind of like that guy that says Mindshare over and over. That guy. Work. Yeah, I know that yeah. guy. It's, it's know, like I drilled mean, in my head now, this Mindshare thing. Same. The only issue I have, though, that I, I made a mistake and I walked into his presentation nine minutes late at a conference last year. <laughs> I was running off three hours of sleep and he, and he singled me out. I, I heard he does that type of stuff. I think I'm wearing the same shirt from last year too. <laughs> but I will say, not only did you walk in late, but you came and sat right at the front. You know, there was only one seat left. I'm like, I have to sit there. I, I'm going to give that one to you. That, there, there's points for you, brother. Um, but so, okay. So the whole time, so you're figuring out, you know, uh, what the brand is coming together. Now, I guess to this point, what was the whole idea of that even? Like, obviously you're selling real estate the whole time. Mm -hmm. Why are we coming up with this brand? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, if I'm working for a company, they've got their colors and their logos. Why is it that you're, you've decided, like, I've got to have this, this kind of thing. And I'd say I get it because I understand from my side as well, but I'm, I'm curious, just what was that driving force there? Well, I never wanted to be that guy that was stuck to, a specific brokerage. Okay. Right. I didn't want to be, you know, James from Royal LePage or James from Remax. Right. And there's so many realtors out there who use that. I'm going to use my, my own name and, and spin it together. Like realtors out there who call themselves James Malonis Remax. That's not a brand. They're just identifying that you work for Remax. Right. And I think that's what, um, what people get mistake with branding is that they just tie in the brokerage they work for and they're like, oh, you know, I'm so-and-so from that brand. That is my brand. That's not a brand. You're a commodity at this point. Drop the mic on that one right there. That was, that was an important point, everybody. Is that, uh, and not, not just the importance of being able to port that, that brand anywhere, but almost how are you identifying yourself in your own way so that people yeah. know who you are, right? And I, I use James in the city as an alter ego because I'm a natural born extrovert. I'm very outgoing, very in your face. James the City is no different, but I hate my last name because of what it represents. So I don't use Malonis anywhere. That's why everybody saw the advertisement said James Lewis. Lewis. So Lewis is actually my middle name, right? Gotcha. And it, um, actually my, my full name is in Greek, which is like 357 letters and it's way too long. <laughs> my mom, when I was born, switched my name legally from Demetrius Elias Malonis to James Lewis Malonis because it was just too much to handle. And my mom's got an even longer name than I do, but she didn't want me to be made fun of as a kid because she had that growing up in Toronto as a fob. So I went as James Lewis and a couple of years ago, I dropped Malonis because I was so tired of being referenced to are you so-and-so's kid? Is so-and-so your father? Right. Because it had a negative connotation because of who my father was. Yeah. And I didn't want that anymore. So I use James in the city always to push myself forward. I introduce myself to people as James in the city. At conferences, I'm introduced as James in the city. If I could legally change my regal registration from James Malonis to James in the city, trust me, I would. Yeah. Could, could, could you not? I don't know. I have to figure that out. I'm sure if Sandra Kirkland's watching, she would know because she swallowed the rule book on anything real estate. For real, so, eh? Sandra here. Sandra! So, um, like, she would know. But I, that's if I could, I would because I hate using Malonis on any marketing. Got it. Okay, cool. So tell me this now. So, so, so uh, brand has been built. You know, you've got an idea for colors and stuff. We know kind of how you're sharing that out there across your, your marketing channels. I'm curious, but I mean, where does your business come from? Is it, is it, you know, is the majority of it from people you know? Is it from people you don't know? Is it connections through people you know? I mean, again, talking about the extrovert and, and just, you know, wanting to be out there with people, right. socializing. 
where does business come from for you? So technically my business comes from referrals and events and things like that. But if I were to calculate where my business comes from or like where it funnels through yeah. is social media because, okay. and this is the way I, I count it. If you're in my database outside of social media, I don't count you as a social media lead, right? Like let's say David, you and I have been friends for 20 years, right? We went to school together whatever the case is. I have you in my database since the day I started real estate, you were getting my, my postcards, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the newsletters, everything like that. If you come to me six years later and you want to buy a house, you're coming from my sphere of influence, right. even though you message me through Instagram. Yep. But if I met you at an event and I don't have you in my database, but I have you on social media and then you make my way, your way to my database, you're a social media contact. Got it. So, okay. But still, but either way though, you're saying that these people are going in to your database. Like, Oh, here, there's a good one then. So have you moved social media contacts like Instagram people into your database? Not until they express that they want to do real estate. Fair enough. Or they have that conversation that just inquires about. Yeah. Cause then I can, then I fish for more, right? right. Let me get your email address. I can set you up on, on collab. Um, let me get your, your mailing address. So you don't miss one of our value added newsletters. Right. Your real matter of garbage, right? It's just another way for you to get my face in front of you. Um, we call it mindshare, bro, but, um, you know, I'm just saying. See, that was a perfect plug. <laughs> you know what? I haven't had my You walked working. into it, brother. <laughs> I haven't had my opportunity for TV yet. I'm slipping. I'm sorry. Uh, um, but but uh, no, I'm, I'm sure Cheryl's counting how many times we say it. Oh, I know. And you know what? What's really funny, though, is um, I, I did another episode with another speaker a few months back after reality, and we calculated how many times I said a certain word to match it to mindshare. <laughs> I, I, can, I can imagine I know who that was. <laughs> and that was over, uh, over some whiskey. So that was a, an interesting conversation. But anyways. I, I know um, exactly who that was. Right? Uh, but, no. but he's definitely a, one of our boys as well, for sure. Oh, yeah. But no, so 90% 90, 90 of my business yeah. comes from social media and okay. Instagram specifically. Last year, I think I did either 18 or 20 ends just from Instagram. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now let's be clear though on something. Cause you said it, it's, you've got the following there. You're building yeah. it through your lifestyle brand, but you're not just, um, you're not passive with your Instagram. You are incredibly active. Like I know, you know, we converse a lot through our social channels all the time, whichever ones, Facebook and Instagram, we're always talking, but you post a lot of content. You also engage with people. Like I've noticed that you will comment, you will react, you yeah. are there. So from those people, like to say 50 to 20 ends from, or forgive me on the number, um, from Insta, let's say last year alone, mm -hmm. there's some people sitting here going, oh my God, that's it. I'm going all Instagram. But it's not that simple. No, this is seven years of relationship making in the process. Three of those deals were people that I had met years prior through Instagram that I had to nurture that relationship because they commented on my staging photos or a video that I did or a lifestyle shot. And then the conversation engaged, but it wasn't like I made a post and the next day, Hey, come sell my house. Cause if that was the case, I would have done 17,000 transactions this year. Right. Right. It's, it's nurturing those relationships. So whether it's Instagram or it's Facebook or you're farming, it's all nurturing relationships. And that's what it comes down to. So for everybody listening to, 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 to again, understand that, you know, he's getting a lot of business from Insta. He's very, very active. He get engages with people. He builds relationships. It's not just having an Instagram account and expecting people to follow you. But I also don't sell on Instagram. Okay. Right? It, Explain, that. Explain that. Explain that. Yeah. And this is chatter that I get all the time. James does no business. James doesn't do enough business. James has no listings. James has no buyers. I don't post every fucking thing that I do on Instagram. I mean, I do, but I don't post all my real estate shit because I don't need my haters following how much money I make. Right. Right. Sure. Like, that's the biggest thing because realtors are always out there. Just listed, just sold, coming soon, open house, this, that, this, that, this, that. I don't give a fuck how much business you do. Stop posting it on Instagram. Like enough already. Um, tell us how you really feel. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, like explain that one a little bit further. Cause I've said that many times. It's like, you know, even I'll, I'll be, you know, doing a presentation, whether it's stage or virtual or whatever. And I'll say to people, you know, let's connect on Insta. I'll, yeah. You follow me. I'll follow you. By the way, the only reason I won't follow you is if I go to your account and I realize that all you have are listings and open houses. Right. That's boring. I don't want to know. If I have to scroll past nine photos to see what you look like. 
I'm unfollowing you right away or not accepting your follow. Likewise. Right. And, and that's the problem with realtors. That it's always, here's my listing. Here's my listing. Here's my sale. Because realtors are so afraid that if they don't post how much business they have, they're not going to get new clients. I've gotten so much new business by posting photos of myself that my husband shoots down in the distillery or in the St. Lawrence market that we just shoot across Toronto with my cell phone. All my captions are real estate related because it's giving you advice. People are stopping at the photo because they're like, what the fuck does James have on now that he's wearing some stupid outfit? And they scroll down and it's, you know, real estate related captions. And then that hooks them in. Right. Right. So I don't look at, at the, the likes and the comments anymore because that, you know, we live in a very Kardashian world where we're obsessed with how many likes our posts get. I look at how many shares and saves my posts get. Because that's where I know I'm being effective with my communication. Tell us more, because you said that to me once in a private message or, or somewhere we talked about that. And you mentioned yeah. that. You even sent me some sort of screenshot about that stuff. Yeah. Just so, can you share a little bit more for people? Because the, there's a lot of people listening that, uh, like we started, have an Instagram account, but they don't leverage it the same way, you know, that right. you could. So on Instagram, you can, have, you can have your profile set up two ways as a personal, regular, everyday Instagram account or a business account. And I'm not saying it has to be, you know, Joe Schmo as the person and then Joe Schmo real estate. It's whatever your account is, but your back end is business related. So under Instagram settings, you go, you change your account from personal to business. After about a week of posting, it tracks your analytics. So it tells you your ideal demographic, where they are, their age range. Like my, my following is 25 to 40 in Toronto and they're female. That's the majority of my following. So but now also, you know, but now you know who's following and you know who to talk to and what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. And it ties into the events that I go to, Fashion Week, TIFF, Hollywood North, charity events. These are all the, the ladies that I'm interacting with, right? So also when I post, if you look under engagement, it'll show you how many likes, comments it has, but also shows you how many times that post has been shared and how many times it's been saved. So a share could be sharing to a story, sending someone a DM, whatever the case is. But a save is what I really want to know. Like, you're saving my post for a reason. Yeah. Either yeah. you're going to talk shit about me, which 50% probably will, but 50% are saving it to read that again. And that's where I know I'm doing something good. You're seeing the value. So again, it's not about counting the likes and, and, and everything else or the views, but this is more about the deeper analytics that, again, the business profile within Instagram uh, allows for. So are you, I, and I know you mentioned like newsletters, postcards and stuff, and I, I don't know what you currently do, email, whatever, but outside of Insta, you know, how else are you marketing to people? Let's say, you know, building mind share with that audience. Right. So if you've made your way into my database, you are getting a monthly postcard and a monthly newsletter from me. Okay. That way you have something tangible to open in the mail. So hold on, you're a big Instagram believer, but you've got, you believe in the power of tangible, physical, let's say even paper. Yes. Like I am the odd millennial out there who still sends mail. Hey man, we know that millennials look at paper as the bright, shiny object. Right. And that 76% of millennials actually prefer to receive paper than email because it's a bright, shiny object. Yeah. And my newsletters are just, they're honestly, they're garbage. I, it takes me 30 seconds to draft it together. It's the same standard template in my marketing department. gets printed out, stuffed, on and off it goes. My note cards are where it's effective because they're handwritten. Mm -hmm. So the exterior is always like a, a plain little photo of whatever. The inside is always a handwritten note. Hey, David, I was, you know, walking down Young Street today, saw a black Harley, thought of you, XO James. Yeah. Pop it in the mail, right? But you get it every month, yeah. right? So sometimes it'll be, um, you know, just a reminder that I'm here for your referrals. It might be, you know, the motorcycle thing, whatever the case is. But I always try to do something where I'm being engaged with you, right? My clients now, my database are taking that and shoving it on their social media. Yeah, see? Right? They're like, oh my God, look at this nice handwritten note. Let me post that up on social. And now you've gone from sending somebody something in paper to yeah. putting it on social. And now we yeah. go back to building your brand. This yeah. is you building relationship using other channels other than just digital and social, which, which you, you love and you're, you're a master at. But this yeah. is leveraging a cross-channel approach. And now it's funny how it goes full circle and people now take you know, that tangible thing, put it back to social. And all the yeah. time, your brand is building the mind share. Exactly. And it, it, it's amazing who you, know, you idolize in Toronto society when they eventually follow you back. There was one socialite who I have admired 
for years from the charity world who she is, if I could be 10% of the woman or the, the, the person that, that this woman is, I'm not a woman, but if I could be 10% of the person that this woman is, I would die happy, right? Okay. And it's taken me years to get in front of her. And I helped out on a photo shoot a couple of years back that she was on the cover. I got the location for this photo shoot where there was, I basically got them a $5,000 venue for free. She recognized me there. The magazine launched, she recognized me there. A few more charity events and fashion events. We connected a few more times. Now she started following me back on Instagram. When I saw that, when I saw so-and-so hit that follow button, I screamed. You could hear the music going off in the background, right? <laughs> right, it was like, can I die now? Like I was happy because now <laughs> I'm in front of someone whose husband owns a multi-billion dollar development company. Wow. Somebody who has been in the real estate game for generations going back to the great grandfather who have ties to Toronto society. Now, how did that come about though? Mindshare. That's it. I love it. I love it. So, okay. So you're using a cross channel approach. And again, you know, for everybody watching and listening, I'm, I'm kind of going through the, the checklist of the steps that we're going through with James here, because, you know, this is the type of stuff that you can, you can, you can listen, you can hear, you can hear and then listen to all of the stuff that both of us are sharing that either of us share individually at any time that anybody shares. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to listen to it, but it's another thing to have the step-by-steps of how can I implement. Yeah. But the one thing that's very important to understand as well is that, you know, the way James went about it or the way David's gone about it is not necessarily the way you need to go about it, but listening to the steps that everybody's taken, this now allows you to whiteboard and formulate your plan for how to go ahead and, and kind of build out your lifestyle brand. And for those of you that, you know, haven't got one, you listen to some of the things James said at the start, right? It was, he started to find his groove. He started to find his voice and understand who he was. Then it was started, it started to whiteboard around the brands and the colors, the logos, what, yeah. you know, what portrays his image, you know, you fast forward and now it's, how do I get my message out there? And, you know, understanding that again, social media is as powerful as it, as it is, it still takes a cross channel approach to do this. But now let's come back to the social media thing, because you, uh, you've been really, really gracious with people um, in posting the social media calendars, like you'll put out your content calendar and say, here it is, like, here's how I do it. Here's what I do. Whereas like, and I know, I know the type of work that goes into that. Like I've got the big desktop calendar. I'll take, you know, three hours and a couple of Heineken's on a Friday night, uh, the third Friday night of a month and I'll lay out the following month. And it's not that there's other things that don't come up, but you know, it takes a lot of time to do that day. It's racking your brain, pulling your hair a little bit to try to think of like, you know, forward thinking for weeks and, and days, weeks and months, like a month ahead. But, you know, doing it saves you a ton of time afterwards. Right. So yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering how often do you do yours? Okay, so I'm gonna be brutally honest. Normally I do it 60 days in advance. Okay. I have been lacking or yep. slacking, I should say. The last I think COVID has, has fed that to a lot of people though. Yeah, it, it, that is one, but you know, back in May, I had a little bit of a health scare, went into the hospital, took a couple weeks to recover. Yep. And then when I got back on my feet, business just boomed. So I haven't really had the time to do things, right? I've had photographers reaching out, hey, can I shoot you free of charge? I don't care. I'll pay. I'll pay to shoot. I don't like, I know your time is worth money. I'll pay, but they want to shoot free of charge. I don't even have the time to say yes to them. Right. Cause it's like every minute of my day is accounted for. Yeah. Other than the whole rent for sale this afternoon. Um, <laughs> That's just very, very important stuff. That, that is mental health for me. That is mental. The same way somebody might take a 20 minute nap, <laughs> me going to hold rent for to buy overpriced shoes is my mental health. That is my well being. Um, but no, it takes me 60 days to write it. And this is where I get really fucking pissed because I had someone who you and I both know who is trying to mock something very similar to what I've done in the past with the lifestyle component of my brand. And this individual flat out on my page said, stop copying my content. I almost lost you to stop copying. Yeah. I'm oh. like, I write my content months in advance. So the shit that you're posting is stuff that I've recycled, that you've recycled from me months back. So check yourself. <laughs> right? And you know, here's the, there's nothing wrong with using somebody's content. I mean, I've gone, my good friend Desiree from my old brokerage, I've gone to her page and I've copied some of her content and I've told her, I, I like the way you've written this. I'm going to use the same heading or the same um, theme and just put it into Jane's words. 
it's not verbatim, right? Because I'm being authentic to myself. These people are out there trying to be James in the city. They're trying to be David Greenspan, yeah. right? There's only one guy who can deliver Mindshare 101. You can call yourself the Mindshare guru, the Mindshare yoga person. There's only one Mindshare original. Like I'm the OG of the in the city. When I see these other people popping up within the city, I'm like, dude, that's been, you guys can't see the video. I'm I'm giving you the Italian hands right now. Like (laughs) (laughs) the people on the podcast are going to listen to this thing on iTunes. They're going to be like, what? (laughs) I I, I just can't, I can't like be authentic. Um, And I'll, I'll go back to my content. I posted last year or six months ago and take a post that I've written with a new photo and change it up again. Cause the messaging is still relevant because I'm right. delivering items of value. And for people who don't know where to start, put yourself in your client's shoes, right? I can give you five posts right now in under 30 seconds that you can start writing tomorrow. Take the five steps to breaking down how to sell your home that you would tell your client prior to getting on the market. There's your five days of posting. Break up those five that? steps. Did they get it? Say it one again. Do I say it in French? Say, say, um, say one more time. Take the five steps you would tell your clients on how to sell their home or how to get their home ready for the market before they actually hit MLS. There's your five days of content. Post that, break it down. Do the same thing for buyers. Do the same thing for the closing process. Do the same thing on offer negotiations. You have stuff to post. Okay, I love, love, love that and thank you for that. So when it comes to content calendar then, let's go through that process. Yeah. You know, are you taking a big desktop? Like I take a big desktop calendar. How do you write yours? Is it, is it digital? Uh, it eventually makes its way to digital. So but, but it where does it start? Because for me, I like the pencil and the eraser. Like I like to scratch shit out and move yeah, it around. Yeah, it and usually all starts with tiny little scratch pads and then okay. they get glued to my desk. And then from there, it makes its way to the big desktop calendar. And then I review it all from like a bird's eye view. Yep. And I'm like, that shit, that shit, that's good. This is good. Move that there. Insert video here. Insert shoe post, whatever the case is. So it's not always real estate. And then it makes its way into digital because I almost always have a stockpile of photos to use. Mm -hmm. I can now go into my Instagram drafts, create these posts in the order that I want them laid out. So when I look at my drafts from the bottom up, I can see my feed and I can see what it looks like. That's how I structure it. Perfect. And then so, so you said you're doing it every 60 days? On average. Or or pardon me. You, but you do it 60 days out, but is it, is it a 30 day window that you're creating or is it a 60 day window? It, it depends. Um, like some months, like sometimes I can, I can draft like 90 days worth of content. Wow. Right? So, that's, that's huge, man. Well, December is a really slow month for me. So I use December to kind of like chill out, get in the zone for Christmas and Hanukkah travel for the new year. Like that is my December. It's very little business talk. Gotcha. Okay. So I start planning 2020 or 2021 or 2022, right. whatever the case is the fall of the yeah, year. Yeah. So, so I you just like, start writing it out. Yeah, I can do January, February, March, in December. And then wow. probably like in February, I'll start looking at April, May. But also when I have ideas that pop into my head, I write them down. Right? Where, so where, where do you put them? Just on a, on a scratch pad? Like I use Trello. Um, I'm, I'm a very pen and paper kind of person. Yeah. Right? I need to see it. So I'll put it into, and this is how stupid I am. I'll, I'll write it in the note section in my phone. And then I screenshot that note section. Then I delete that note. But at the end of the day, I have a bunch of screenshots in my phone that I have to clear out before I go to bed because I'll screenshot MLS listings. I'll screenshot yeah. conversations that I, that I want to reply to. Cause then I look at my, I use that as almost like my assistant, right? Like to my to-do list. Yeah. But that's important that you just brought that up because this comes back to what we talk about with the system, right? Having the system for how you do this, like content calendar for me very quickly. Again, like I said, it's a few hours, a few beers and I sit down and I write it out and I think of a 30 day window. And mm-hmm. so what I'll be doing is every single day as I'm, podcasting, I'm talking to people, I'm presenting, I'm, I'm conversing, I'm making my phone calls, I'm jotting down scribbles and they'll pen and paper scribbles, literally. Yeah. And then from there, I will make sure that all that because I still sit here with my black book and many people who've taken any mind share training or heard me before I, I'm, I go everywhere with this thing. But you know, everything at some point transfers back into, you know, the digital form, just so that it's accessible anywhere, anytime. Right. So it goes into Trello, 
Now it's time to sit down and lay out the content calendar. I've got Trello open. I've got my notebook open. I've got my screenshots. I've got all sorts of stuff there. And now I start to lay it out in a paper calendar from the calendar. Once I do the bird's eye, I move it into my CRM. And now literally it's like every day, you know, the night before where I take 15 to 20 minutes to plan my day ahead, I will look at it and go, oh, you know, social media for tomorrow. You know, what's on tap? What other things maybe do I want to add in there? Now, if I've got to create any graphics or I've got to create any video content or podcast content, I know exactly where I'm going with it. Yeah. It takes time. That's my process. For you, screenshots and, and, and you know, notebook to screenshots to, to digital, you know, that's your process. And that's what I was saying to everybody a few minutes ago is listen to what we're sharing and then ask yourself, how does it work for you? How can you take what we just shared with you and apply it for yourself? What about scheduling out uh, how many times a day you do this or even what time of day that you do this? Like, you know, how can anybody listening to what we're talking about right now with like content calendar kind of take that and apply that, but think to themselves, oh my God, they're laying out 30 days or 60 days or 90 days of content, but how many posts a day? You know, is there a specific time a day? Yes. So I am on my actual feed, a one post a day person. Very rarely will I do two posts a day. I was doing two posts a day during the start of COVID because I was vlogging my, my isolation, right? And it became like a comedy show for people. So I do that in the afternoon, but I, it depends on the day, almost always 8.30 in the morning. Okay. Because I know from past analytics, that is my best time for my clients or my database being online. So I'm going to get the most engagement at 8.30 in the morning, Monday to Friday. Instagram tells me Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3 o'clock, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday at noon. Depending on the actual post, engagement flips. So I'd like to stick with my 8.30 in the morning. It's in Whether my- Instagram tells you go at 12 o'clock, you're like 8.30. 8.30. That, okay. that is just what I've done for years. That's how I know my, my people are the most active during COVID has been a little bit of a struggle because not everyone's up to their normal wake up time and routine, right? Because if you think about it, 8.30 in the morning, some people are already at the office with their coffee, yep. avoiding their emails and scrolling Instagram versus, you know, still laying in bed while their baby's screaming in the corner kind of thing. Um, okay, cool. Know. So one post a day to the biz page, one post a day to the personal. I only have one account. Uh, pardon me. So the Insta. Yeah. So, and some people will fight me on this. My Instagram posts, get automatically shared to my Facebook business page. Yeah, okay. Because it's real estate related. I hardly ever put anything real estate related on my actual James Lewis personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something to do with like a RIA or a podcast or a um, a conference that I'm speaking at. Other than that, it all goes to the James and City page. But it's once a day. My stories, on the other hand, are constant. Because my stories are what I'm doing going to the gym, grabbing coffee, hitting the office, on showings, um, presenting offers, events at night, whatever the case is. And my story- I, don't find, I find a lot of people don't take enough advantage of stories. And that's, that's exactly it. I can get 40% more views on my stories than I'm getting likes on my actual posts. And that's what we know. I mean, there's, there's something out there that says, uh, you know, we're seeing the store, we're watching stories 15 times more than we are scrolling our feed. Why people would rather tap, 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 tap than scroll. Don't quite understand it. But I would also think that from a story's perspective, it's fresh. Like you can rip through, you know, 50 different people in a very short amount of time, but see real time stuff. Like I took a picture of our fig tree in the backyard today. Right. You know, and then, I mean, people might wonder why you took a picture of a fig tree. Well, then you got to watch my stories because I did a video right after that to tell you why, but you get it. Like it's, it's, it's fun, right? It's a story of what we're doing in a 24 hour window. Exactly. And it helps people understand more about your life because you can really bring them in. And that's where my brand really started to take off when I use my stories more effectively. Because it allowed people to, who don't really pay attention to my feed, but watch my stories, like most people do, that, you know, Scott and I have been together for 150 years, and, you know, I love shoes, and whatever the case is, because now I'll go on appointments with someone who I've never met before, on a listing, per se, and the first thing they'll ask is, nice shoes, are they new? <laughs> right. <laughs> how is Scott do it? You want to get into his heart, ask him about his shoes. <laughs> like, I've already opened up the world to, to my life through my social media, so there's none of that, like, 
you know, I'm sitting with you and your wife and, you know, here I am, my name is James, I've been in business for seven years and I like donkeys and whatever the case is. You already know that because you follow me. And that takes right. an hour out of my listing appointment. That's right. My appointments, I'm in and out in 20 minutes. Your house is worth 1.5 million. My commission is X. See you on Thursday for photography. Like that is my listing appointment because they already know me. Exactly. And that there's the key though, right? And there's the thing is a lot of people are scared. Like a few years ago, it was a stigma around, you know, oh, I don't, I don't want to put my kids on social media. I don't want to, you know, share stuff about my family. Um, a friend of mine, and I use this line a lot, so it's totally stolen from my friend Chelsea. But, you know, she always said like, talk about date night, but like, you know, tell people you're on it. You don't have to tell people what you talked about and what you did, but you yeah. can just say that you're there. Yeah. And it's that thing of letting people in. And now you talk about like, you just referenced, you know, Black Harley. Um, I've got people that like message me and they're ripping into my Maple Leafs and they're still doing it. And I love it because they're not even Leafs fans, but deep down, everybody's a Leafs fan, right? So it's that thing of, you know, that's where I start to get poked at, but people know who exactly you are. You're real, right? right? You no, know, exactly. You become so, authentic. And that's where, you, and I shared this a few weeks ago, I think Brad Inman was the original one who, who said this, but the consumer of today, whether it's real estate, car sales, any kind of brand, they want to work with someone who's an influencer in that category versus the previous generation. So in real estate, for example, they're going to want to work with industry influencers versus their parents' realtor because there's a whole different way to doing business. I like that. Sorry, I, I, I uh, taken some notes on that. I think that was a, that was a key point right there. It's just that the, the consumer of today really would rather work with an influencer than, than their parents' realtor. And yeah, I think that- It's not quote on my Instagram. I'm gonna send it to you after this. No, that, that, that was great, man, because I think if everybody internalizes that and just uses that, you know, it's how can you start to become that influencer? Even if you are, you know, the parents' realtor, how right. can you begin to build a brand? So, so from a, you know, social media game plan, we know you're, you're doing about once a day. You've, you've sort of found your time that you're doing it. So when you're creating a, a social media content calendar, you're writing that stuff out. Um, what about engagement? Mm -hmm. You know, actually communicating with people. Um, I think I said it off the top. I'm pretty sure we were on air when I said this, but you actually comment and engage with people. You're actually talking to people. It's not that like, you know, Oh, look at me, look at me, but I'm not going to talk to you because I'm just too big and too cool for you. It's like, you know, people engage and you engage back. Yeah. I'm always the last person to comment, right? It's I, like, again, I'm a stubborn Greek person. I'm an Aquarius. I have to have the last word, right? In any argument, I have the last word. So I'm the same thing on my social media. I'm the last person to comment on a thread. So if, if you said great outfit, thank you. You're welcome. Heart. Yeah. That's it. I'm not gotcha. that food, right? But I also take the time at night when I'm sitting on the couch watching endless HGTV, I'm scrolling through my feed and I'm commenting on other realtors, on my actual client base, my database, the people that I want to be in front of just to say, hey, I'm here. Yeah. I see your shit. We're good. Cool. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's uh, super, super important. Now, you realize I'm going to start messing with you now when you like try to end off the conversation with the heart. I'm going to come back with something else and just see if you keep going. Um, <laughs> just keep you busy, but no, <laughs> let me, so let me ask you this. You, you, you've, you've built the brand, you're out there on social, you're doing your other marketing channel stuff. Um, now it comes time and we just brought up the listing presentation, but now it comes time to start working with James in the city. Right. You've told me stories about some crazy stuff you do. And I mean, crazy in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, but what that experience looks like, right? I mean, you've told me like wine and dine. You've told me like uh, chauffeurs. You said like send them to the spa, you know, things like that. And I mean, I'm just curious, like tell us a little bit more about that customer experience, you know, the cars, the meals, the spa treatments, or, or what can people expect when working with James in the city and what kind of maybe advice or, or, or tips can you provide to anybody who's looking to build that lifestyle brand in their real estate business that they can start to leverage? And, Everybody's getting, let me just preface this also by saying, you know, what James does may not work for you, whoever you are listening. Um, what I do may not work for James. You know what I'm saying? So it's, everybody's got their flavor, but um, yeah, man, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Cause I, you, I mean, again, it's, it's impressive. Yeah. So I like my clients to basically experience what I like to experience. So I'm very bougie and I like certain things, So I want my clients to not have to think about things like that. Right. Especially with, so it started off with a selling a seller client a couple of years ago where I built my concierge program. And I, I know you heard my presentation at Reality back in February 
where I talk awesome. to them, yep. where I, um, the way I treated these clients and how I, that's where the, the concierge program started. But I think the point you're trying to drive home is with the chauffeur. And when I have, I get a lot of referrals from other realtors and if my clients are from out of town, whether, you know, it could be, you know, Mississauga or it could be Ottawa. If a client's coming from out of town and they were referred to me by a realtor and they don't know Toronto, they're buying a Toronto condo, I've hired a driver for the day. I'm not talking Uber, I'm not talking a taxi, an actual hired driver that I have paid from 10 till six to be my individual person to drive me around, but also to drive my clients around. I'll pick up at Union Station, we'll go look at the condos, we'll go for lunch. I drop you back off at Union Station, whatever the case is, wherever your car is parked, because you don't know the city. So you're gonna get lost trying to find parking. You're gonna get frustrated on one-way streets. Let this guy do his job. I can sit in the back seat with you and I can point things out that I couldn't do if I was driving. Because I'm focused, I'm a horrible driver, so I'm focused on not killing myself, right? But if I'm sitting in the back seat with you, I can point out that, you know, on the corner of the street is a pizza vending machine. Like you're hungry two in the morning, you walk downstairs, you put in your credit card, and here comes out a little fresh pizza, right? Or do they you know, really that, have that? Yeah, it's it's insane. It's right on Adelaide and it's the best thing ever. A pizza vending machine, maybe. I mean, I've seen hot dog vending machines, and that to me is a no-no. The hot dog, no. I won't even eat a hot dog. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, the pizza vending machine, though, it's a little weird concept, but... Yeah, but, 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 but there's a lot of validity to do to this of like, uh, being able to show the people around, especially in a city like Toronto, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right, man. Finding parking, like, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm in Richmond Hill. I get like heart palpitations when I think I got to go downtown to like an area that I haven't been to yet. It's like, right. let me map out where the parking lot is, where the one way streets are, you know what I mean? The time of the day that I go down there, it, it, it can certainly be frustrating. So you start to think about the experience that that potential, uh, client or that client has, yeah. You want to make sure it's the best experience possible. And it's, it's nothing groundbreaking. I just take the reverse of what cottage realtors do, right? I, you know, we have two very good cottage realtors that we're friends with. Yep. And whether I'm going to the eastern side or the northern side, I know if I'm looking for a cottage, they're going to take me on a boat to look at them. Because yeah. you don't care what the front of the cottage looks like. You want to see what looks like from the lake. Right. right? That water, <laughs> that, that shoreline. Exactly. If, if a cottage realtor did that for me, would they put me out on a boat to look from the backside? I'd be like, done. I'm sold. I want to work with you. Right. Instead of like me having to drive out, walk down to the dock, turn around. Oh, that's what it looks like. You know what I mean? It's taking away the thought. Like if my clients have to think, I'm not doing my job. But at the oh. same time, sorry, go ahead. no, no, no. Say, say that part again and, and, and define that because I think that that's, a, that was important right there. Like if my clients have to think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want them to think. Right. Like I don't want them to say, what about the alarm? What about the lights? Or, you know, if they're traveling, the garbage, like all that's taken care of. I built that concierge program for a reason. Right. Like you need a, a tradesman done. Like it's little things like that. I've seen, um, I've seen posts where, you know, people are complaining about the fact and people being realtors are complaining about the fact that their client called them to figure out how to make the grass greener. And like, no word of a lie. Like I've seen that before where, you know, oh my God, I can't believe my client called me. Why do they like, well, I'm not a landscaper. And I'm thinking, dude, that's mind share right there. Like that is, that is it. Like they thought about their house. They thought about making their grass greener. They thought about you. How can you help? Yeah. That's kind of what I just took from you though. Honestly. And I took this from a realtor from my old brokerage who has been around since the day God created earth. And this guy, for every single deal that he does, whether it's a buy a sale or whatever it is, he pays to have the locks changed. That's his client's closing gift. He pays to have the locks changed. A client lost her keys. And she called the realtor. Instead of the locksmith, she called the realtor. Hey, I lost my keys. What do I do? 20 minutes later, the locksmith was there. Bill was taken care of. That's lifetime value right there. Absolutely. So Absolutely. chauffeur, showing people around, you know, locksmiths and, 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 and landscaper status, like, you know, taking on all that stuff. What kind of other things can people or are you doing even from an experience perspective? I mean, real simple. Birthdays are the best thing. Like I had a client who bought multi-million dollars worth of real estate with me in one year. And I know this guy loves cars. He bought a brand new Tesla. This is going back when Teslas were new to the market. Yeah. And I sent him out to Oakville to race Ferraris. That was his birthday gift because we bought, sold, and closed all within weeks of each other of it before his birthday. And I'm like, I'm not going to give you a bottle of Vub and say happy birthday. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, here's $6 million worth of real estate. I sent him down to Oakville to race cars with his son. They raced Ferraris and Lambos all afternoon. Oh, that's cool. 
right? I've also had, you know, female clients of mine who are first time buyers who were, you know, on the verge of, of not getting their deal done because their mortgage broker is lagging their feet and they're exhausted and this, that, and the other. I send them for a facial at the spa, right? But, but like, doesn't this all cost me money out of my commission? Like, why would I spend all this money? They're already my client. Are you in business to help people? Yeah. There's your answer. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean though but but so many people think that way right like they're going i don't want to put out the extra dollars to do yeah. this extra thing because it takes away from what i'm gonna make yet when you really flip it around you talk yeah. about lifetime value we talk about your lifestyle brand you think about it when you think like you know what was the experience i had working with james this guy sent me to drive Ferraris. Never mind. He picked me up in a car, drove me around, and then sent me as a closing gift to drive Ferraris. Like, are you kidding? Where have you heard that from other realtors? And the, the way also I, like, what? Who, who's your guy? Who is this guy? Exactly. And no, no experience is the same for every single person. Like, I call myself a walking holiday because you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> and that's the same with my clients get. You don't know if it's going to be Christmas or Kwanzaa. You don't know if you're reading Turkey with the Pilgrims or you're dancing in the rain. Like, it's honestly something new every single time and that's what keeps it fresh and exciting and honestly it keeps me from not going crazy because i'm already a little <laughs> you and me both a walking holiday that that was it right there so so here then you know we talked even uh, about your and, and, and i mean long-term follow-up plan would obviously be once it's kind of that idea of everybody's They've been introduced to the brand through the social media channels and through the way you market yourself. They've then engaged business with you. You've made the experience from top to bottom, just first class, memorable. You've made it an experience. You know, yeah. you've made it a holiday. Um, after the fact, and, and I mean, you've already alluded to a lot of the follow-up you do. After the fact, I guess that follow-up program goes in play, but you never ever forget about the value of, of paper or pen to paper, staying in touch for birthdays and th that type of stuff. Yeah, and honestly, the way I, I call it is lather, rinse, repeat. So I don't know if you saw my presentation at the buzz. It was um, market, communicate, sale. Because we're yep. realtors third in our, in our resume. Like we're way down at the bottom, right? You got to be a marketer communicator first. So once I'm done marketing and communicating and I sold you, I'm recycling the process. Now I'm going to market you and communicate with you for your referrals. So it doesn't just end. Like we do the deal and I won't see you next week. That's a transactional agent. I'm not a transactional. I've walked away from deals that would have made me hundreds of thousands of dollars because it wasn't right for my client. And I told them not to do it. I've made more money from doing that than having taken that deal. Because if that, I had made them. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a big deal right there, right? If Looking I out for your client's best interest. Deal, so I can make, what, $250,000 in that one deal. I'm not looking out of their best interest because it was not going to be right for them. But instead, I've made double that from the referrals. So why, why are some people then having such success with their brand and some are just completely failing? Is it the fact that they're more caught up with their brand than they are with helping people? Yeah. I mean, you got to think about it. Realtors first and foremost are narcissists, right? They're, they're so into themselves and how they are perceived and they're, they're, and I use the word brand loosely here because most realtors are commodities over brands because they're disposable. If you have a solid brand, you'll be around for 100 years. If your brand is shaky and you're relying solely on transactions, you're a commodity and you're going to be disposable like a razor. Love the it. problem with realtors not having success is that they don't stick with it. They try everything in the pot. Right. I'm going to do ads this week. And then I saw a conversation where the guy said, I should do video. I'm going to do videos next week. Oh, James said I should do Instagram. I'm going to do Instagram next week. Facebook video and Instagram, you try them for one week and they haven't lasted. If you go to the gym January 1st, are you going to have a six pack January 30th? I've, I've always wondered, like I, I've been like, why isn't it working? The only six pack I get is a pack of Heineken. It doesn't make sense. But anyways. <laughs> it's all about consistency. Yes, the gold. And, and look, we're, we're about to open up our, uh, I mean, our VIP room is open. We've got some people uh, waiting on there. So uh, we're about to get into our private Q&A with our Mindshare Masters once we get off air here. But um, what, you know, 
what last words or tips can you share with anybody watching and, and listening to this right now? And for all of our Mindshare Masters, by the way, if you're watching us live through the Facebook feed, get into the group right now, get on the Zoom, let's get in there, let's have a, a, a nice Q&A with James, but um, where you guys can ask your questions. But you know, what last words or tips have you got for anybody that's you know, watching, listening, just anything about the, their brand and sort of building that? Honestly, be consistent and be authentic. That's all I have to wrap it up with. Like, okay. consistency is is one thing. It's going to be the whole way. But if you're not authentic, people will see right through that shit. If I came out here in a three-piece suit and a tie and tuxedo shoes to sit on a, like, to go on a listing appointment, I wouldn't sell any real estate. Right. So just I'm be you. Yeah. I love and that. this is where people don't understand. You don't have to be dolled up 24 seven to sell real estate, be authentic to you and what works for you and that client and that time, but also what reflects you in your moment, in your mood on anything you do. James, where can people find you? On Instagram at the James in the city or www.jamesinthecity.com. Love it. Guys, follow him, go check him out, learn from him, understand. Again, it's all about what you can take in and, 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 you know, sort of massage that mold it to make it for you. It's not that you got to copy anybody. As he just said, it's about the authenticity around who you are. So just be you and be confident in who you are. Um, last question before we go here. What made you smile today? Um, honestly, being alive. <laughs> okay fair enough yeah. i love it man yeah james man thank you i really appreciate you uh coming on the show today i appreciate you sharing all this uh we'll certainly have to do it again and follow up and and uh i just i want to encourage everybody again go and follow this guy on insta um ask him questions he's always getting very involved but uh yeah james man thank you buddy no thank you for having me you're either listening to this on itunes iHeartRadio, google podcast stitcher or spotify or maybe you downloaded our free industry syndicate podcast app or maybe you went to my website mindshare101.com and while you're on my site make sure to download your free copy of the seven ways to communicate ebook to help you build more mindshare so that you can get more market share and i want to invite you to join our private mindshare community we meet twice a month live to share ideas tips tricks and do some mind sharing. And all of our Mindshare Masters get access to our private VIP Q&A with our special podcast guest each week. And you get daily marketing and sales tips delivered right to you, plus the opportunity to motivate, learn, and network with a whole bunch of people just like you, going through the same struggles in business as you, looking to achieve like you. When you're on the site, just click on the coaching option. Then group coaching, and for only $19 a month, literally like 62 cents a day, you will have access to a powerful coaching resource every single day. Seriously, just saying 62 cents sounds crazy to me too, so make sure you check it out. Wherever you like to consume your content, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you haven't yet, connect with me on Facebook at Mindshare101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan 101 This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in.